In August 1958, a boy was born right here in Burbank, California. With no connections to the entertainment industry, he started his journey with nothing but sheer talent and creativity. Little did he know, growing up watching monster movies in his childhood home on Evergreen Street, that he'd become one of the most prolific and important film directors of the last half century. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about the one and only Tim Burton. The city of Burbank, we're known as the media capital of the world. And we take pride in past and present residents who go on to accomplish great things. Tim Burton was born and raised in Burbank. <laughs> educated in the Burbank Public Schools. <laughs> and, and even created a drawing one time as a teenager that adorned the side of our, gar our garbage trucks. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Uh, he follows in his father's footsteps, who greatly contributed to the Burbank's Park and Recreation Department and has a baseball field named after him, Bill Burton Field, named in his honor. Oh. Last year, he generously sponsored an annual award for the Burbank Film Festival. And this award promotes filmmakers in this hometown and thus bringing his Burbank legacy full circle, so we appreciate that, thank you. So today, and this is true, you can look this up, it's official. With the power vested in me, as the mayor of the city of Burbank, I do hereby proclaim today, in the great city of Burbank, Tim Burton Day. Well, as a true holiday, take the rest of the day off, everybody. <laughs> That's really the only holiday that really matters, but uh, no, it's such a great honor for me. I mean, it's my own hometown. It's, uh, it's uh, beautiful downtown Burbank. Uh, does that still exist? I think, I guess it does, okay. <laughs> no, it's, it's, again, it's, uh, Burbank helped made me what I am today, whatever that is. So I, it's something that I really, is deep, deep in my heart, so it's very special for me. And again, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, everyone. And Tim, thank you so much for you, doing sir. this. Great to see you. Um, I normally begin every episode of this podcast uh, asking our guests where they were born and raised, which I think we have addressed. Um, but I do want to get into it a little bit more because... Um, you know, over the years, you have expressed that sort of what you just alluded to that, um, you know, you were very shaped by Burbank for better or worse. There were elements that were great, elements that were complicated. Can you talk about, but one thing that you've always said is that without Burbank and without those childhood experiences, the filmmaker we know today would not exist. Yeah. So just break it down. What well, was I mean, it? I, you know, I, I, I keep reading that I hate, Bur you know, like the, the press has a way of sort of taking what you say and, and take out the nuance and subtlety and, you know, like go right to the, the core. But uh, I think, you know, and when I said about, the, whatever I said about Burbank, it had more to do with my own psychological state of mind than it did with the actual city of Burbank. Do you know what I mean? So and that's a bit too complicated and psychological to go into now, but in the sense that you, you know, you grow up in feeling a certain way, uh, Burbank helped shape me, because, you know, there was, like, there, my first film school was the Cornell Theater. There was this amazing theater that, that was torn down, I think, in the late, in the 80s, I don't know when it was, but, uh, you know, they, they would, for 50 cents, you could see a triple feature. I, like, I saw one amazing, true. I saw War of the Gargantuas, uh, Monster Zero and Destroy All Monsters in one go, you know, 50 cents. So that's where I learned my love of film and, and that really, so there was some amazing places and, and it was incredible. There was like five movie theaters in Burbank at a certain time and then they all got sort of taken away. But for me, those, those, that place, especially that theater was very, very special to me. And you've said that during your years in Burbank, which I think up till 12 you're living at, was it Evergreen? 
uh, Street. Is that yeah, what we're, right down the just street? Just down the street here. Then you we can all walk over there after this. Yeah, we'll do a little check it out. <laughs> Uh, then you moved in with your grandmother, also in Burbank, right? Um, but as a, a bit of a loner as a kid, you were kind of thinking about things, dreaming about things in everywhere from some of the cemeteries in town to... Yeah, well, the one right next door here. You know, I used to play around there. You, yeah. know, you know, that was... Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, and I could look out my window. The thing that freaked me, I looked out my window at Disney, and this was like the the weird, I call the Bermuda Triangle of Burbank, because I could see where I was born at St. Joseph's, and then I could see the cemetery where all my family was buried, and I was, in, so it was like a weird Bermuda Triangle that I had to escape at a certain point, because it was just too scary. <laughs> now, you, you've also said that as a kid, you were, you know, not only a bit of a loner, but sort of not particularly uh, communicative, verbal with other people. You lived in your imagination, which manifested itself through drawing. Can we talk about um, just how that entered the picture? And uh, as, as was noted, I mean, to the extent that it was, you were talented enough that in Burbank, your work, uh, anti-littering art was on the back of every garbage truck. I wanted a $10 Ten dollars, and at that time, that's probably like about a million now. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> no. But drawing was an outlet for you. You, what kind of things were you drawing as a kid? Posters for trash trucks. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I mean, whatever. But also, I mean, the the movies that you were drawn to, and I believe maybe therefore some of the some of the things you were drawing were things that other people might find frightening or scary, but that you actually in a way related yeah. to, right? Like, what are we yeah, talking about? Yeah, but I mean, about? like, I, you know, I didn't feel that different. It felt like, you know, I love famous monsters. Of film. I wait for that magazine to come out. I love monster movies. I live near a cemetery. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you use what you have. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was good. Totally. And, you know, and, and I think also, too, growing up in Southern California where you don't really have seasons, I think that's why I kind of got into, you know, like things like Nightmare for Christmas or Halloween, just because it gave you a sense of occasion, a sense of season that you didn't get through the weather. You know, I mean, to experience like holidays, you had to go like to to the the main like at Save On and look at the holiday displays <laughs> to kind of experience. Right. So um, you graduate from high school, and then there's I this. Think, yes, I did. Oh my! <laughs> I, had ch- I had to think about that for a we'll minute. We have to check. Yes. Well, no, we won't tell. But uh, you, instead of going to a traditional uh, sort of college, you end up being one of the first, a member of one of the first classes at CalArts, which was yeah. sort of this vision of Walt Disney, yeah, was, uh, yeah. essentially like a farm system for Disney Animation Studios. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you went there, I believe you're a class behind a guy named John Lasseter. Yeah. You're in class, I think, with Henry Selleck. What, what led you to go there? Yourself, what were you kind of ho- thinking about for your future? Uh, a scholarship. The really. scholarship, yeah. No, because yeah. it was a, truly it was an expensive school, and I think I was lucky at that time because, it, like you said, it was the start of the program, so they were a little bit more, liber- you know, at handing out scholarships, which which is something that that was like I needed that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and so and so I felt very grateful to, to, to kind of be able to. You know, I you know I, I like drawing. I didn't. You know, it's strange growing up in Burbank because, you know, like you said, it's, it's a media, there's all the movie studios are there, but at the time, it just felt like you could have been a million miles away. You know, there was no real, the only time that you sensed that, 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 that it was Hollywood really is like, sometimes you go down to the park and see them sh- shooting laughing or, you know, like yeah. guy falling over on a tricycle or, you know, whatever, the, the, like those old TV shows. Yeah. You had a little bit of a sense that there's so, something happening movie-wise or TV-wise, but it, it was, it, at that time, it was very f- far removed in yeah. a strange way. So at CalArts, you're essentially the equivalent of, you're asked to pick a, essentially a major. Why was yours character animation, which apparently was in a way looked down upon by some of the other people there. Why was that? Well, that's because, again, the scholarship was through that. I mean, okay. Disney, I think what happened was that, that, that you know, the, the animators they had since, uh, like, Snow White, they never really, they never really sort of taught new animators. So it was really the nine guys that were there from the beginning. Yeah. And so I think it, it, ultimately that's why, that, that, that's why the character animation program became a thing and they were giving out more scholarships is because it was a new program. Got it. And, uh, yeah, that was... So, 
your style of drawing was not necessarily what other people imagined at Disney, or it wasn't like what was going on at Disney or other places. And this was evident even while you're at CalArts. What, you've talked about a day, I believe, at a farmer's market where you just sort of had an epiphany. What happened? Well, no, I just, it was like, I was very frustrated because I, I, and even at Disney, you know, I, when I was working on things like Fox and the Hound, I mean, I, I was really bad at it. And, and uh, it looked like roadkill, my foxes. <laughs> and unfortunately, there wasn't a scene where they were hit by a car. <laughs> so they needed a lot of work. Right. And I had, you know, I worked with this animator, Glenn Keane, who really took me under and, and sort of put up with my, Bad Disney style, and uh, that's once you leave Cal Arts to yeah, go to I, Disney. Yeah. So, but in Farmer's Market, I, I just had this moment where I, I felt like I couldn't draw. I was frustrated, and I just sort of said, "I don't really care. I like drawing. I'm just going to draw however I want." And it really, it, it was like a mind expanding experience. I never had that before, where it just, I just all of a sudden started drawing in a different way. Not better, not good. I just more. It just sort of was more me and. Uh, I'll never forget it. it. It happened in a in a second, and things like that don't usually happen like that. Right. So, at a certain point, you leave uh, CalArts, I guess, because a sort of silent animated short of yours caught the notice of Disney. Yeah, well, I mean, at the, every at what you would do at Disney, you know, you, you would do a piece of animation. You you know, you you storyboard it, shoot it, edit it, do do it all, and, and at the end of the year, Disney would come. And it was like, kind of like being in the army. It's like, okay, we recruit you. They picked like a few different people to go work at Disney. And not, not a lot, but like one or two or three. And I think the second or third year I got picked. And, you know, I was having financial trouble. So I decided like, well, I'll just go, to, you know, get a job at Disney. Because I think at, for the character animators, I think that was sort of the old, most of them, the goal is to work at Disney. Right. And so... Uh, until they got there and then they changed their minds. <laughs> well, that was sort of, sort of your experience, right? So you get there in 79. This is before, in the years, sort of before Eisner and Katzenberg come in and revamp the place. Yeah. And they're spending years on a project like Fox and the Hound that you mentioned yeah. and Cauldron. Uh, well, yeah, Cauldron. There, there was a, like you said, from Cal Arts, there was an amazing group of, of animators, you know, uh, John Lasseter, Brad Bird, uh, John Musker, you know, the fact is, like, the success that they had, like, starting, I think it was probably, like, Little Mermaid, they could have had that 10, 20 years earlier, because there was this very, you know, artistic, hungry group of talented people that were just sort of languishing away. I mean, I think it's like John left to do, go do Pixar and other people did, you know. So it was a strange time at, at Disney when I was first there because it was in transition for sure. And Glenn Keane, who I think might still be there, was, you were essentially under him, right? And he, tr he you've talked about, here's a guy who's like the ultimate Disney kind of pro. Trying to work with you to do the Disney style. Yeah, he put, it was great. I mean, I have really, I, you know, I, I, I still have an a amazing memory of what yeah. he put up with, yes. <laughs> but instead, they eventually, it seems like they recognized they have a very talented guy, but not in the traditional Disney vein. And so can you just explain how we wind up with you basically being given, I don't know what the word would be, almost like... Uh, uh, in-house sabbatical or well, something. It was, straight, it was really, again, yeah. I, I don't think a, a studio ever was like that or yeah. would be like that again. Because yeah. I, you know, so I couldn't draw foxes. So then they go, well, well, so go draw, they were working on Black Cauldron. So I sat in a room for a year by myself just drawing whatever I wanted to draw, which was incredible. I mean, yeah. it really creatively, but I felt a bit like uh, Rapunzel or something. I felt like <laughs> I was... Like, I could do whatever I want, but to no one or to nobody, you know? So whatever these great things I was doing was, like, nothing. So, but at the same time, they, they, they had other projects going on, and so they go, oh, well, you know, maybe... So I, I, I did designs for lots of different projects that never really happened. But then, you know, like, the, then they said, oh, we want to maybe do something with stop motion. And so they gave me, like, a little what they called development fund. Which had been, Louis though, a Vincent. passion of yours, though, right? Since yeah, Ray yeah. Harry, I was at, oh, like... yeah, yeah, no, so, yeah. I mean, I, I felt very, you know, so I got to do Vincent, then I got right. to do Frank and we, you know, and sort of things that never really would have gotten done in an ordinary 
circumstance. I just want to note for folks who may need a reminder or whatever, Vincent was, I think, a six-minute uh, short that you made where you get your childhood sort of movie hero, Vincent Price, to come in and narrate it. Uh, and a kid who's, I think, seven wants to be Vincent Price. That sounds like Tim Burton might have been himself wanting to... Uh, have been like Vincent Price at one point, right? You know, I mean, he, you know, his movies acted almost like a psychologist, you know what I mean? Feeling alone and tormented and all of that. I go, yeah, I can relate to that. And so he, you know, like everybody has their kind of thing. And that, that for me, all those movies sort of psychologically helped me and kind of sort of guided me through my own twisted, you know, mental field. Which, yeah. So, and, you know, when I sent him the thing, it was incredible because he just responded. I didn't know him or anything. And so he responded, he got it, and, you know, he helped to actually get it made that way. You know, by and, his, and you his obviously had, a, you, there was mutual um, affection there because I know you made a documentary with him. He then came, comes back with Edward Scissorhands, which we'll talk about, and all kinds of things. But, um, but Vincent then gets followed by another sort of side project of yours, Frank and Weenie, which again gets remade and expanded years later. But this idea here, just again, for people who need a reminder, a kid revives his dead dog. Um, you know, the, the sort of just the- Doesn't everybody's? Yeah, right. <laughs> but I, I think that, um, I think it's kind of interesting that there aren't too many examples in history where you know, neither of these films, neither of these short films got seen very widely. And yet, the, the film that comes after them is Pee-wee's Big Adventure, your first feature as a director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, as I, as I said, it was, it, that was incredible. Like, those short films that nobody saw, but it, like Paul Rubens and, and, and the producers and Warren saw it. So it was, you know, it was like what you would hope for. It was like, it was like a calling card and, and actually getting my first feature was easier than getting my restaurant job at Sir George's Smorgasbord, <laughs> which was weird, you know what I mean? I went through, so I had to fill out more forms and do more checks and balances for that than my first feature, so whatever. And just, just for the historical record, Tell me if this, any of this is wrong, but so Frank and Weenie gets seen, I heard, by Stephen King. Is that right? Because Stephen King supposedly then tells Mark Canton or shows it, tells Mark Canton, who's the president of production at Warner Brothers, Mark Canton's looking for a guy to make a film with Paul Rubens, who we, who we just lost earlier this year. But then through that, Paul Rubens watches Frank and Weenie? Yeah, no, I mean, I, like I said, I, I feel like with him, it, it's like if he didn't, want me to make the movie, then I would, you know what I mean? So I, I was very lucky to have a few so supporters and f from him and then certain executives at the studio that were very supportive of me. And so, you know, I always remember those things. You know, I, I remember who in those times were very, uh, you know, hadn't done anything, you know? So th those are the kind of people that are special to me. And what's kind of amazing is your four, four Pee Wee, which, okay, it's a $7 million movie, I believe, gross $41 million, essentially like a live action cartoon, right? I mean, he's, a, he's not like any, uh, anyone else people had seen up to that point, and no. you put him in this world. Depends of, on who you know. Yeah, you right, know maybe. I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're just 20, 20, I'm trying to do the math here, 20, uh, 26 or something, 28, at, for your first film, um, and, yet, and it's very well received, as I say, seven million cost, 41 million. Critics divided at the time it grew on people. It, it was on some of the 10 worst films of the year. <laughs> my friend, that and Beetlejuice were on the 10 worst films of the year it, list. People are catching up to you, it takes very them a much. while. But Many people can say that. <laughs> but here's the thing, for three years after Pee Wee, which had put you on the map in a big way, you're, go you're off the screen. There was not another film. What was going on during those years? <laughs> well, I was offered a talking horse movie, which I turned down. <laughs> and then, I don't know. I, you know, it's weird. I it's hard for me to account for my time. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I, I was trying to do things, but... I, I don't know. I've been quite lucky. People always. I've been very lucky to, to to do things, but then people are always slightly concerned about me for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know why. But 
So I've always had a strange relationship with Hollywood. You know, I've been, I feel blessed and grateful and lucky and then <laughs> slightly tortured at the right, same right. time. So I don't really... So quite how for it. the first film after Pee Wee do we end up with Beetlejuice? Yeah, well, the, which <laughs> is first, first but certainly not last time working with Winona Ryder, Michael Keaton, and someone who we are very fortunate to have with us today in the room, Danny Elfman, your composer. Yeah. 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 How, well, no, well, like Danny, like it was weird because like I used to go see Oingo Boingo before, you know, before yeah, I even knew I'd ever be making films and always thought music was quite cinematic and, and like movie stuff. So. Yeah, it, it, it was amazing for me to do like Pee Wee's Big Adventure and to see him do like Pee Wee's Big Adventure, which was in kind of a new, you know, big orchestra, all this kind of stuff. So it was quite, it felt like new and exciting and seeing somebody like me on that, just at a similar time doing the same kind of, with the same kind of weirdness. And Danny has said, quote, the only difference between us is that Tim's hero growing up was Vincent Price. Mine was Peter Laurie. So there, there is a similar... Yeah, no, I mean, you know, uh, people, <laughs> people that like monster movies, there's a certain connection. With, right. you know, but why, why connection. the story Beetlejuice? Especially, it's interesting because, but for the actor strike, which, inter, which came just like two days... Uh, if it had come two days later, you would be yeah. done with yeah. Beetlejuice 2, yeah. which we will get... Hopefully yeah, sooner than yeah, later. If the strike is but, over, yeah. But yeah. They've got two days left. Two yeah. days. But why, where, where was, what was the root of the idea of this story about this eccentric group of, of uh, folks that are at the center of Beetlejuice? Well, you mean, why doing it again? You mean, is that, No, the uh, first time. Oh, Let's first, go back. No, yeah. no, I mean, the thing was, I, th I think it was like what you were saying. It's like, I didn't, you know, Pee Wee surprised everybody. Then I kind of, like, I struggled to kind of see where I was in Hollywood, and it was offered several things. But then Beetlejuice would seem like the strange, I, I couldn't believe that a studio wanted to do it, if you know what I mean. That's kind of why I wanted to do it, because it didn't follow kind of any real sort of trend right. in a way. And so that's why I kind of liked it. And then I got to work with all these people that were, you know, I, I kind of learned it from Pee on Pee Wee's Big Adventure, all like people like, Paul or Phil Hartman, the writer, and all these people were good at improv, and I sort of saw that world, and then I got to work with like Michael and Catherine O'Hare, you know, people that were really good at improv, and so yeah. that excited me, and so I got into this vibe on Beetlejuice where it, there was a structure, but then we sort of kind of making up things as we kind of went along, which was, again, exciting to do. It did feel like kind of like an animated film in a certain yeah. way. Yeah, and at the end of Beetlejuice, just for people keeping track at home, I believe we see for the first time at the very end, along with the merry-go-round situation, the first appearance of Jack Skellington, don't we? This is the... <laughs> I mean, I've been drawing that since I was a child. You okay, know? So in was, other words, yeah, I mean, those kind of things, they, they kind of come around and keep coming around. And yeah. That's those, your, that's your, yeah, I mean, I, even when I'm on the, you know, I, I kept, I would draw something and then kind of, think about the character, rather than think about, I'm going to draw a character like this, a lot of it comes from the subconscious, which I always found was more important to me and more real. Yeah. Okay, so now, a year after Beetlejuice, 1989, your biggest scale movie yet, let's just note, this was a $30 million, 16 week of shooting across nine sound stages, Batman. This is the first, I think, truly, you know, dark adaptation of a comic book, which is now the only way people do it. So you were at the forefront of that. But, um, you know, and you've, you've talked about it being sort of, like most of your films, having an element of, uh, that you can personally tap into. I think you're saying it's essentially actually about depression if you look at Batman in this or other things. But I guess I just wonder, um, why, what your experience was on that one to the extent that, you know, again, first time doing action, first time working on that size, yeah. to the point where you get physically sick. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, we shot, we, it was funny because we shot in London and they never did this before or since. We shot six day weeks 
the whole time in the winter. So I didn't see daylight for like months. And yeah, and it was something I'll never do again. And, uh, and I, they won't do again because actually I, it was counterproductive. Yeah. So it was, you know, it looked good on budget and on paper, but it was, uh, but it also felt, it was exciting because it did feel at the time new. You know, I mean, it did feel like, oh, you know, making these weird costumes and more, like sort of, darker and more psychological, even for one of those types of movies. So it did feel quite exciting. And we built sets, you know, we had to hold Pinewood to ourselves, so we had a big back lot. We, yeah, so, I mean, it was, it was very exciting to... to and in forward. hindsight, I mean, now people may not remember, but in the lead up to the film, you guys were taking a lot of incoming fire. People are saying you're going to put Michael Keaton. Yeah, they thought it was going to be like Batman? Adam West. They thought it was going to be yeah. like that. And that's why I was happy to be in England because it was before internet and stuff. So I mean, we'd be killed now. Then, you know, it was still. But yeah, I mean, I I was happy to be away and not in, not hearing all of that sort of noise. So just as in terms of throughout film history, you can look at certain directors and the one, two, three punch, like in terms of chron chronology. For you, there are, I think there are a few that can stack up with 88 Beetlejuice, 89 Batman, and then 90, 1990, Edward Scissorhands. And that's... And of course, following Pee Wee was the first of them all a few years before, but your first three films, Pee Wee, Beetlejuice, Batman, all made when you're in your 20s, all made for big studio Warner Brothers, all kind of sleeper hits. People didn't think they would be as successful as they were, and then they were very successful. And now after that, when you think, no, 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 no. <laughs> you, but you think that you would get some benefit from having a track record, and yet you go back to the same studio that made those three, Warner Brothers, and say, all right, here's what I want to do next. Edward Scissorhands. And they say, not interested. No, why don't you, Fox is just down the street. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, but that's, that's why I'm saying, you know, that's when people, add, oh, but, like my career is very, everybody thinks it's easier, but it, it never, it's always a struggle. I think that's just the nature of film. I mean, every film you do is a big thing, you know, and it's hard to mount it, it's hard to get all the people together, and it's hard to get the right, you know, elements. So, you know, I don't, I never thought, ever, ever, you know, I never expect things to get easy, or right. I never expect it to be that way, because, uh, yeah, in fact, yeah, I mean, I, you know, after about, in fact, I remember talking to them and because they were talking to me about doing a, a third one, and like halfway through the meeting, I said to them, I go like, "You guys don't want me to do another one, do you?" And like, no, no, no. But why don't you make another film like Edward Scissorhands, like somewhere else? <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, because I think I, I, after the second Batman, McDonald's got upset because they didn't understand what all the black stuff coming out of the penguin's mouth or whatever <laughs> kind of shit. That they, I go, well, you realize at that point it's getting a little okay. corporate for Does you. Does anybody know what goes into a happy meal? I mean, what are you, what are you, what's going on here? <laughs> okay, but not to, I don't want to gloss over Edward Scissorhands no, 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 no. because this was so, uh, so such a, a, a great um, movie and, and, and moment for you, part not least because this was the first time of many now that you and Johnny Depp work together. And, but what I want to just, yep. Uh, so it starts, correct me if any of this is wrong, but starts with a sketch of the character that you had done well before any script or even maybe even an idea of a script. You show that to Carolyn Thompson who writes a script. And now this is a character with wild hair who dresses in black, is largely nonverbal, doesn't like and really can't touch other people, and is seen as an outsider by many in the suburb in which he resides. What possibly made you think of such a guy? <laughs> a lot of free time. Yeah. And uh, no, I mean, that, no, I mean, honestly, that was, you know, I grew up with monster movies and fables, but that, for me, I always wanted to make something that, something that I felt and as a teenager, as a young, as a whatever, any time. You know, I, I was just somebody that if, you know, went to hug me, I would flee. You know, I just, I, I felt those things. And so, in, in the spirit of, like, monster movies or, or fables, it's like, for me, it was something that was probably the most personal or one of the most personal things. 
And, uh, you know, and it was strange to, you know, that's why it was hard to kind of talk to a student. It's like they don't really, at that time, the idea of doing a weird fable or whatever, that, that, what's a fable or fairy tale, you know? So uh, it, it was something that was hard to get to. But again, doing it for a lower budget and doing it, you know, away from Warner Brothers, I guess, you know, it was just something that was easy, you know, it was something that meant a lot to me. So we talk about this being a, a breakout moment for Johnny Depp, who up to that point was sort of teen idol from TV and whatever. The studio actually had wanted you to cast Tom Cruise, right? Well, I mean, they, they always had lists of people. I mean, you know, they have lists of people. I don't think they do it as much anymore, but at the time, you know, they got this, you know, they, they, every student had a list, whether people were right or wrong for it, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I went through lots of periods where they, you know, it took a long time for actually people to say somebody like Johnny, you know, before... You know, he was, he was always sort of second or third on the list until a certain time in life. But that happens a lot. You know, that was very much of a Hollywood way of de dealing with things. Johnny said, quote, Tim showed me several drawings of his Edward. I'd read the script, of course, but Tim's drawings said everything. I instantly fell for the character. He made his way into my body. I was traumatized by Tim's drawings. They haunted me. You guys also talked about him playing Edward like... Lon Chaney, the silent movie well, star. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, it's like, like when you meet somebody who, who likes certain kind of movies like I did, there's a shorthand, you know what I mean? Because I wasn't a great communicator, I could communicate with certain people by showing a crude sketch, you know, and it's not that you could take these things literally because they don't look real. So I was always very grateful when somebody could see and get a feeling from a drawing rather than looking at it literally right, because... Right. You, couldn't really connect the two. So that, that was a form of communication that I had with him, and I have, I'm lucky with several other collaborators yeah. that could kind of read between the lines. Yeah. After that film was both Batman Returns, which you just reverenced, and while you were directing that, you were also producing The Nightmare Before Christmas, which was, yeah. Another one that I think, in a way, goes back to your days at Disney, right? That was a long, yeah, I mean, you know, and when I first designed it, like, it was like 10 years before we actually got the production going. So it, it was something that I, I held out because, I, you know, I went to lots of different ch uh, publishers to get, make it a children's book, and then I went to people who said, we'll make it a TV a show or a TV but I always held out for the stop motion because that was one of the reasons I wanted to do it. Um, you know, growing up with Ray Harryhausen and certain stop motion things like even the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Yeah. I loved it. So if it, that was always part of what it needed to be. So I, I resisted other forms of, of doing it and other forms of animation to, to sort of wait for the right time. Which, and then your old... Uh, Cal Arts yeah, no, class yeah, make. Yeah. Well, he, yeah, Henry, Henry Selleck. Yeah, no, he, 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 you know, he'd been doing some stop motion. You know, stop motion was not a big deal. You know, I mean, things like the Ardman Studio, but it was a, sort of a, a dying art. And so, you know, luckily, it's it's a very it's a very special kind of person that does stop motion. It's a, it's a different than other forms. I mean, every form is great. But that was something that was very, very beautiful. And it takes a certain kind of patience, a certain kind of fun, artistry, a certain kind of, I don't know, it, it, there's something really beautiful about the tactile nature of it. So, you know, uh, it, it would have made it unless we could do it in stop motion. That, so that was that was. And we'll note that you championed that with, okay, so you produced also later on James and the Giant Peach, co-directed and produced Corpse Bride. Um, and produce nine, so stop motion has been a, a running thing. Yeah, no, like I said, I, the first movie I ever saw was like uh, Jason the Argonauts yeah. in the Catalina Theater, you know, and I, I'll never forget uh, the feeling of that. And once you get hooked by that, that's why so people that love stop motion, you, 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 it stays with you. Totally. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a beautiful form. So Ed Wood in 1994, this is a movie about quote unquote, the worst director ever, although I know you may beg to differ about that. Um, but 
Johnny Depp, who had barely spoken in Edward Scissorhands, now comes back as this unbelievably verbose guy in Ed Wood. Um, and you've said that Johnny's inspiration, and I, I need you to explain this one to me because I don't, I, I, I find it very thought provoking. Ronald Reagan? <laughs> yeah. He's got strange uh, influences, which, uh, you know, I say, I'm, like this or that, he says, well, I go, whatever. You know what I mean? Everybody has their own weird... Sometimes they're, you know, he'll say Ronald Reagan or say Angela Lansbury and certain things, he'll say whatever. I, I think it's just whatever comes to his mind, that's right. his inspiration. Right. I don't know. Now, there's a scene in Ed Wood that you've called your favorite in that film and one of your favorites in all of your films, when Ed Wood meets the woman who will become his wife. What, can you take us into why is that scene... So important to you. Well, I just like the simplicity of it, you know. And I, I love the octopus scene. There's several scenes in it that I like, but it's something that I just like the simplicity of it. And I like, I just like the idea of somebody accepting. You know, it's, it's about acceptance and it's about people. And I just, I just felt it was just a quiet, sort of beautiful moment yep. that was simple. Martin Landau, by the way, wins Best Supporting Actor at the Oscars for Ed Wood, um, late great Martin Landau. Two years later, just, I mean, if people are thinking about these as, you know, one and then the next one and then the next one, there, there's almost nothing in common from film to film because I think the next one is Mars Attacks. Well, that's like an Ed Wood film, though, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're saying Mar Mars Attacks? Yeah. yeah, that's my Ed Wood that's film. That's your Ed Wood, yeah. yeah. That's my plan nine from outer space. Thank With you a, lot of a lot yeah. of big, big yeah. stars, yeah. Yeah. more than he would have Everybody gotten. wanted to be in plan nine, but they couldn't, right. yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, now, because Mars Attacks maybe wasn't received in the way that the studio may have wanted. Well, that's why I moved to Europe, because it was very well received there. In fact, it, it actually, it was, it was the most successful I, film I had done in, ever in Europe. Europe. Yeah. But back here, was that the cause <laughs> of why? Because you had been planning to do Superman yeah. and spent a lot of time yeah, yeah, prepping. Yeah, about a year. Yeah. Was that, do you think, derailed because of Mars Attacks? Yeah, sure. And was that, that was upsetting? Well, no, because also, too, like, I got the green light for Batman. Like, they were, I was working on it a lot. But it, 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 as soon as Beetlejuice came out, all of a sudden it got green lit. So I get, that's part of the way it goes. I yeah. mean, that's, that, you know, I accept that. And sure. I accepted it at the time. Yeah. Back with Johnny in Sleepy Hollow, which you had sort of thought of as a... Uh, I heard as a silent movie almost at one point that when you first envisioned it, um, kind of an hom homage to the Hammer horror yeah, films yeah, that yeah. you'd grown up with. Yeah. You even put Christopher Lee <laughs> in it. Well, that was funny because at the time I go like, what? there's a little part, what about Christopher Lee? And the producer kept going like, he's dead. And I go, <laughs> I didn't hear he died. <laughs> no, he's dead, he's dead. <laughs> and then many years later I saw him and he goes, Hey, it's funny, that dead guy, he went on to do three Star Wars and four uh, <laughs> Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Pretty good for a dead not guy. Not bad, not bad. Um, Planet of the Apes, two years after that, this was the first revisitation of it. Now, you're making a face, but hold on, no, hold no. on. I don't make faces, other people make faces. <laughs> but. This is 2001. Yeah. You're remaking, the, for the first, first Planet of the Apes since, in, in years, right? Charlton Heston even makes a cameo. This is where you meet Helena Bonham Carter, right? Beginning of a collaboration there. Rick Baker makeup. A lot going for it, but then also the challenge of, like, sort of it sounds like what you ran into with Batman, where you sign on to a project and the budget is not necessarily locked and the script has to change. Talk about what it's like. I don't think you were any lesser of a director on that than you were on your no, others. No, 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 I think, I think if I were analyze it, which I don't really go back and do too much, but I, what I would say about that is, is that it, it, was a, it was a strange thing. Right, there was budget problems, there was this and that. And the thing is, I think it, it was a transition in terms of effects. It's like the things that they're doing now where it's all digital, and, and you know, they do amazing things with it. But I went, I, the reason I got interested in it was I love the old school of it. I love the idea of makeup and actors pretending to be apes, you know? I mean, to me, that was funny and, and interesting. Yeah. But 
It wasn't really, you know, I think it, it, what they would have really liked is what they ended up doing next, which is kind of, you know, great digital animation and re defining it that way, which I, which I get. So it was, it was, I think it was at an awkward time. And uh, I mean, there was lots of things I loved. I loved the people, I loved the cast. I was amazed by them going through all this makeup. You know, it was, it was an incredible experience. And, and I, you know, it was difficult, but I enjoyed it. And I, like I said, I met a lot of great people. 20 years ago, almost exactly, was Big Fish, which is another movie that people love. The story of a guy trying to understand and maybe make peace with his father who's nearing the end. Um, some people suggested this is less burden-esque, whatever that means, because they felt maybe it was a bit more sentimental. Not that that was a good or bad thing, that was just the way they... But you have said that, I, I mean, I believe that you may have uh, lost your own father not long before. Was that... Coincidental? Yeah. Well, no. I mean, I don't think I could have made that movie without th having that experience. It's because it just brought up lots of things about what you know about people or don't know about people, even your own parents. And like, I realized that when they were gone, I didn't really know anything about them, you know. And so there's always this mystery about who they were and what they, you know, what their lives were about. Because as children, even when you're old, you don't really think of your parents as people, you know. <laughs> They're like, they are, They're, right? you know, but. <laughs> It takes a long time to realize that they're people. Right. And uh, so that's, like I said, I, I think it really it, it hit me and it, I was able to do that movie because it, it, I, I could feel those, those feelings. One side note, well, actually one question and then one side note about uh, Big Fish. Would Johnny Depp have been part of that were he not also doing Pirates of the Caribbean at that time, or was there just not know. a role? I mean, like, everybody goes, like, like, with him or anybody I work with, yeah. I don't ever work with anybody just to work with yeah, him. Yeah. I mean, it's like with Johnny or anybody, you yeah. know, it's like the part's got to be right. And, uh, you know, so I never take that kind of club. It's always about the thing, and, and so, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know what else he was doing, but I think there's certain things that, that work and certain things... Sure. No. The other side thing here is... The main character in Big Fish is named Edward Bloom. He follows in the footsteps of Edward Scissorhands and Ed Wood. What's with, what's with the Eds? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm doing Mr. Ed next, the yeah, right. talking horse picture, <laughs> finally. <laughs> Thank you. They finally got you. Um, all right, so back with Johnny, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, 2005. <laughs> the same year that you do Corpse Bride and get nominated for an Oscar for the first time. I don't know what took them so long, but that was both 2005, 2007, back with Johnny again with Sweeney Todd. Now, I don't know how many people went into that one thinking, okay, so Johnny Depp's gonna be singing, Tim Burton's gonna wanna do a Stephen Sondheim <laughs> adaptation, but yet, this was something that, been, that had been percolating in your mind for decades, right? Well, I loved it, I mean, I didn't, you know, it was the only music I remember ever seeing that I loved, you know, when, when I saw it on stage. And so I never really had a desire. And it, but, and it was, it was scary because Stephen saw not, I mean, I'll never forget showing it to him. I was terrified, but he, you know, he was very positive about it. And that meant a lot to me because it's quite complicated. And, you know, what he did was quite incredible. So it was a, it was it was a strange thing, but it was beautiful. I loved doing it. I mean, again, it was even though it was music, it was like a that was truly like making a silent film, having music on the set, and it, it, it was you had it, like an eighty piece orchestra. Or yeah, yeah right? it was great. It yeah. was beautiful. Back with Johnny again for Alice in Wonderland, twenty ten, which only made a billion dollars. That's not not a not a bad not show. bad for a movie no. that the critics hated, but it's yeah, right. good. <laughs> But you, you said that you had signed up sort of a complex experience with that one because I think in terms of, you, you had not really worked with VFX in that way previously, right? Where, talk yeah, about, yeah. Yeah, but even that, we never did, we didn't do a technique, we didn't do like motion capture, it, it was really a mixture. It was like making a, like, oh, let's make their eyes bigger, let's right. make your head bigger, let's do this and that. So we used, it was really probably the most complicated film because there was not one way uh, of, in fact, hardly any of the characters were together. It, it was the strangest movie well, I ever made. No, no previs or anything either, right? So you don't really no, know. We, no, 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 didn't do any of that. 
crazy. Um, I will know. <laughs> Couldn't do that now. No, 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 it's no tough. They, I'd be long. We time. also have to acknowledge, uh, I would like to acknowledge, that with us tonight is a four time Oscar winner who won one of her Oscars for the costumes of that film, Colleen Atwood. Oh, yeah. So that's great to have her. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Another yeah. one of your. Yeah. Repeat collaborators. No, no. And to be fair, I don't see great costumes. Are, I wouldn't be wearing any clothes without her. <laughs> she, I, I, she, Do you remember what was the first? Me. What was the first film that you guys did together? What? Oh. Um, Scissor hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this goes back to 1990. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, 2012, Dark Shadows again with Johnny. Um, and in a way, I wonder if a bit of a. a you wouldn't have been thinking about this at the time, but was it, for, for sort of practical purposes, a bit of a test run for what you ended up doing with Wednesday, where you're working off of existing material, but putting your own spin yeah, on it? I mean, I don't know. I, I didn't think of it that way. But yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, like, I do things that are just based on whatever my personal weird thing. So yeah, I mean, I didn't think of it that way, but there's elements that I could, obviously when I was doing it, I could feel it. And like with Wednesday, I just, I love that character. So it wasn't really, I wanted to do Adam's family kind of thing, but the Alan Miles, they just wrote this thing. And I just, again, I identified with it. It reminded me of school, it reminded me of how I felt and the character. So, you know, that's what really drew me we're to gonna, it. We're gonna dive into that a bit more in a moment. But first, the same year that you did Dark Shadows, you did the feature length version of Frank and Weenie, which you probably thought you would never touch again after yeah. the Disney years. No, I, yeah, I didn't, the only reason I wanted to do it because I the stop motion thing, you know? I mean, it's like because that was my original and it was like way to go kind of closer to the drawings and to kind of go back into that. So, yeah, no, and to shoot in black and white, and it was beautiful. I mean, you know, for me, again, it's like when you, when you, when you if you ever visit a stop motion set, it's the most exciting because it's like, it's like you build a whole set and it's, it's like you're, it's like when I was a kid playing with toys. Yeah, whole you know, world. It was great. Um, 2014 Big Eyes, back with the screenwriters of Ed Wood, Scott Alexander and Larry Karaszewski, um, another biopic, this time though focusing on uh, a female, Margaret Keene, the artist. And I have to wonder, were you a Margaret Keene fan even before this? Because you have always had sort of big yeah. eyes yeah. at the center of your Well, films. I was like a kid like everybody else and was terrified of those things, yeah. you know? <laughs> and there would be people in the living room, like <laughs> big brother, like these things, I mean, yeah. <laughs> It's like, so it was very suburban, and like, I don't know when Burbank, that, that art was very much a part of my growing up in existence. So I think it was something that I was fascinated by art and by fascinated by what people liked and, and, and how strangely like disturbing they were. So yeah, it fit into my That's great. Um, okay, so 2016, Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, 2019, Dumbo, the full circle moment of you being the guy who Disney comes back to for a, after all the history there um, for a live action version of that. And then it's time to now go more into uh, your most recent and Emmy nominated work on Wednesday, which is one of the biggest, one of the biggest hits in the history of Netflix, which has had some pretty large, largely heavily viewed shows. This is right up there with like the Squid Games and stuff like that. It's incredible how many people tuned in. Um, now, you had not done television in decades. Um, what convinced you that this was something to go back to it for? Well, Alan Miles who wrote, wrote, wrote it. Um, I, I, like I said, when they wrote it, it just spoke to me. I yeah. loved the, the character, had the worldview that I have. It was like reminding me of how I felt in school, how I feel about psychiatry, authority, everything. So it, for me, uh, it was just, like I said, it, it felt like they had written it for me. And so it, it, it was, like I said, it, and then we were lucky to get, you know, because you even with good writing or anything, to, you need to get the right person. So we were very lucky to find, get the right person. For well, and that's what I've got to ask, because it was apparently a, a huge process to find Jenna Ortega. Can you take us through, like, what, it's, how, do you, how do you go about a search? Well, like it was during COVID, so we had to do everything by Zoom. So it was yeah. strange to cast the whole thing yeah. uh, without 
you know, we never we never met anybody until we were there. So it was a strange it was a strange way of yeah. doing it. But we I, we first fell. I mean, it, it's again, it's like one of those kind of parts. You can have good actors, but they really have to inhabit that one. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you can't totally. say, oh, act kind right. of like stare, right. <laughs> kind of well, and ominously. You were, I understand you also were resistant to the idea of you know bringing in more CGI than was necessary. So we've got thing, uh, yeah. which you were saying, let's do it with yeah. the real absolutely. No, person. No, absolutely, because that's part of it. And we, you know, we got a guy, uh, you, you know, who <laughs> was like the Dustin Hoffman of hands, you know, he was like, <laughs> wouldn't come out of his trailer and all that kind of shit, you know, it's like, all right, if you just bring your hand out, you can stay in there, whatever, <laughs> but... You, you know, but no, but it, but that's the fun of making something. You know, yeah. I mean, and again on the new Beetlejuice, we're kind of reconnected to the the, the fun of making films and, and right. the kind of handmade quality of it. And it's so, you know, it's it's it it, it was it's, yeah. it's fun experience when it's right for it. Yeah. When you saw when you started to hear the numbers, or the scale of the response to Wednesday, could you guys? wrap your head around that was I mean I'm, I'm sure you, you I don't really yeah. think that I mean I don't I I'm always surprised from the beginning of my career if something's popular or a s failure or success either yeah. one is you know could go either way right right, right. Yeah. and will you when our strikes are over and people can get back to work will you be part of subsequent no, uh, there, you know I mean when, when people they can Get back, whenever we can go back to work, yeah, I think there's there's a plan to do that. Of course, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With you, you directing some more episodes. Yeah, I hope so. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah great. Um, okay, in the very last two minutes here, I appreciate everybody's time and patience. We're gonna we're gonna close here with just a few quick things. What's on your bucket list? Is there a genre that you haven't done? A story that you haven't told? Is there anything that you have been meaning to get to? that you haven't yet gotten to? I think there always is, but you know, sometimes you work on, I got lots of, but I always feel like timing is important. And, and like, for instance, like you think something like Nightmare, it, it took 10 years from conception to actually the production getting started. And oftentimes that happens, you know, something, it seems like a good idea, then it's maybe it refuses a bad idea, then maybe it's a good idea again. And so I, I always think there's stuff that, that's whirling around. Um, but I think now, as I'm getting old, I just want to kind of, it's always important to just do things that you really want to do, especially at this stage for me. And that was sort of, uh, I mean, Beetlejuice too must have been surreal to have some of these people from 35 years ago, Keaton, Winona, and then also Jenna Ortega. It must be like your whole life flashing. No, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, no, I felt like it was at my own funeral the whole time. It was great. <laughs> No, it was it was it was it was really nice, and it, it was very special. You know, because like I said, it felt like a it was very very emotional. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure that 35 years ago, you imagined that not only would you be making a sequel in 2023, 2024, but there would also be a musical version of Beetlejuice from which a United States congressman would be kicked out. I'm sure you have predicted that one. <laughs> I wasn't even invited, so I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> uh, lastly. Uh, when you, I know, as you said, you don't often think back on what you've done over these years, um, but now that we forced you to do that, uh, can you describe how, I mean, are you able to sort of step back and look at it objectively and say, this is pretty amazing how much has been packed in and what's been accomplished? Well, or? it is strange when I just driving here, just driving down Hollywood Way, yeah. near Victory, where I grew up. And so it is very, very strange and amazing to be here. Yeah. yeah. And then that, that kind of makes you think about something where... And being back in Burbank. Yeah. You know, it's, it's... The Marriott's changed since I was a child. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tim Burton, thank you so much and congratulations. Thank you, thank you for having yeah. me. Thank you so much. Thank you. We actually flew out a surprise guest to speak on the legacy of Vincent Price. Ladies and gentlemen, author, inspirational speaker, Vincent Price's daughter, Victoria Price. Thank 
you know, of course, the real surprise would have been if we had stitched my dad together and he'd been here to give you this award. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I just wanted to say that every time I talk about my dad, at the end of my speech, I tell the story of how you two met at Disney. And I say thank you. Because, you know, all my dad wanted to do with all those movies he made was reach kids and inspire them to be okay with who they were. You know, my dad was an outsider, too. He did it. He did it with <laughs> me and with a lot of people. So thank yeah. you so much. So congratulations. Thank and thanks. So thank you. Award here. Thank you. Here we go. We're going to get something. There we go.